we are having the privilege of actually participating in this great work of God. And, uh, and if, we, if we can actually get a picture of the glory of that work, we're all, we can be almost desperate. I, I just want to be part of this, somehow to be part of this work of God. Yeah, thanks, John, for joining us, for um, talking about um, Ephesians and the church. And today, um, maybe some of the hard issues with uh, the church. Um, how do we think about the church when there's abuse or hurt or mediocrity or um, whatever? Um, but first, yeah, can you just give us a, a brief introduction to who you are? Uh, yes, uh, John Koblenz. I uh, work at Faith Builders Educational Programs, uh, serve there as pastor, uh, campus pastor, and an instructor, and have really um, felt privileged uh, for the opportunities that it affords to study, uh, to learn, uh, constantly learning as I interact with students and uh, staff, and it's just been a, been really enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think maybe for for this episode especially, maybe some of your experience before that where you spent time, you know, as a full-time counselor mm-hmm. um, might be relevant here just because of having seen mm-hmm. a lot of difficult situations mm-hmm. close up and so on. So yeah, I'll start with a quote um, from the commentary you had written on Ephesians. Um, you say, the church in its current state is not always glorious to us. Um, we are still imperfect. Um, our music is at times off key. Our theology is at times wide of the mark and our interactions with each other fall short of the love we profess. Um, and yeah, I mean, maybe starting with that, how should we think about it when we feel like, you know, our experience of church just feels mediocre. Let's start there with the feeling Mm -hmm. mediocre. We'll get into some of the you know, even even worse situations later. Hmm. Well, I think we always have to realize that the church is in the process of becoming, uh, being shaped. Uh, Jesus is constantly uh, working to bring us to maturity, uh, not only individually, but as as a group. And Ephesians four focuses especially on that on that growing. Uh, to the mature, to the perfect man, it talks about there are the mature, but that's mm-hmm. not, that's actually, the context is not about us individually, it's about us as a group. And so that that's the difficulty that we face sometimes. And the reality is that we can get into um, uh, ruts, into uh, r- ritualistic ways of living in ways that that become empty of of. Christ's presence and our, our interactions become routine. And when our focus is, is no longer on Jesus properly, we, we begin to act in ways that we shouldn't. Uh, we had that in some of the New Testament churches. And uh, Paul, uh, particularly, we have more record of his interaction with the churches than some of the other apostles, but uh, really addressed those things and, and called people to, to grow um, Pointing out some of the characteristics of of carnality or um, spiritual um, immaturity, and uh, so we we face those things, and um, it's easy in that then to become uh, divisive, to 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 want to separate uh, at Corinth. Uh, we are of Paul, we are of Apollos, and and. And so his call to them was to come back to uh, really focusing on Jesus and growing, actually personally growing, growing together as as a group. Um, it is disconcerting. It is uh, difficult where we feel that that the vitality is not there. Um, and I'm blessed when when I hear people expressing a yearning for more, a desire for deeper. Uh, relationship, but we have to be careful that we don't, that in the process of yearning for that with a group, we don't simply become critical and and, um, neglect our personal pursuit of Jesus. And 
yearning for him and love for him and allowing that actually to be contagious in the in the group. Yeah, that's helpful. So you talked about the danger is becoming um, divisive. Um, so, and then you talked about, you know, people need to grow, churches need to go, need to grow. Um, is that part of the key to responding, responding while well there is instead of, you know, using all these imperfections as a reason to be divisive and critical is to say, well, I need to grow up. Mm. I need to be contagious in my growing up. Mm. And actually, just like a new believer needs to grow up, a church needs to grow up sometimes too. Yes, I do think it is It is important. Um, uh, it's it's so easy to see wrongs. It's, it, it doesn't take a lot of <laughs> intelligence or spirituality to see where where people aren't what they ought to be, it takes a significant maturity. And you see Paul demonstrating this, but it takes significant maturity to actually engage with immaturity in ways that are actually helpful and draw people toward the Lord. Uh, it has to be in our own hearts first. And um, they need to, to sense in us a deep love for Jesus. And even in our if if we need to address things um, in a group or whatever, but that it is actually done out of our commitment to the good, not out of exasperation and and um, criticism and just just to point out wrong. Yeah, that's very helpful, um, and that's the difficulty of growing up. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yes, <laughs> that resonates. So John was speaking. Um, at our church here this weekend. And one of the things you shared last night, you talked about stages of growth and the, you know, the infant mm -hmm. spiritually who is hungry to take things in, the young man, I talked about in First John, you know, right to you young men because you are strong. And then you had the picture of the mature Christian um, carrying a load on their back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that resonates with what you were saying about, you know, how do we address immaturity? Because in the in the young man stage, and especially if we're talking about um, men, you know, we talk about the young bucks hmm. who really do have zeal for something, mm -hmm. um, but maybe don't know how to relate to people who are less mature and come charging in. And yeah, part of that maturity and you drew that picture with the, you know, the mature person carrying a burden. And I don't think this is the a negative burden. I think you're referring to them, you know, carrying responsibility for mm -hmm. others. And to me, that is a beautiful picture of a mature person who can relate well to immaturity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe just shift our focus here a little bit. Um, because, you know, what really makes it hard for someone to have a positive view of church and probably makes it hard to you know, even think about um, some of those glorious things we talked about in Ephesians, um, especially when there's been, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, or just abusive leadership, and it's coming, you know, coming from somebody who's an official leader in the church or coming from somebody who's influential, and the church seems to condone it. Um yeah, that's just a, a very difficult um, situation to be in. Um, can you offer any perspective hmm. there? Yes. Well, I certainly don't want to in any way minimize the pain or uh, sorrow or confusion of people who have experienced um, unhealthy or wrong things from leaders. Uh, leaders are in a position where their their words uh, carry special weight, their attitudes. Um, and uh, John writes about um, Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence, and he he cast people out of the church and and so on. And so there there is that that um, that difficulty, that uh, pain that people experience at the hands of, of, of uh, those who are in authority that don't handle that in the way that Jesus calls us to. Um, I don't 
um, obviously situations vary considerably, and so we have to we have to think in terms of um, not being able to answer all of the the particular questions. But there are a number of questions that I personally have tried to ask uh, when I've been in difficult situations. Uh, years ago, in a situation where the the pastor um, actually became very angry at me, he confessed this later. But uh, at the time, it was a very painful uh, situation. Uh, but one of the things is I sought the Lord uh, in that. Um, I think there's a time when we maybe need to move to another setting. Uh, in fact, in this situation, I even asked him if I should, and he thought it would be good if I would. And I, so we've been seeking the Lord, trying to uh, understand his will. And I remember specifically in, in praying, uh, God spoke to me saying, uh, you don't leave until I've done everything in you I want to do. And came to realize that that God can actually do good things in us, even in difficult circumstances. And uh, in that case, uh, one of the things that He worked on me was was my pride. My uh, it was a kind of an involved situation that I, I won't necessarily go into. But uh, I realized that God can actually do good things in us if we are open to Him, even through uh, painful um, things from leadership. And then I remember <clears throat> praying later, and it seemed that God said to me, uh, don't leave until I've done everything through you that I want to do. And realizing also that uh, sometimes in, in difficult relationships, uh, we easily think of it only in terms of ourselves. And... And God may want to do something through us, and I realized that this this pastor maybe needed me as much as I needed him, or that God was at least using him in my life. And uh, I think in that we we don't ever justify wrong. We're not saying that 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 is that is right, but we look to God and and allow Him and be sure that our responses are being guided by by Him. Um, I think that <clears throat> there are times when people. Uh, shift, uh, re go to a different congregation or, or whatever. Sometimes that may be necessary, but not just jumping, not just quickly doing that, seeing that this is guided by God. I think we, we, we have to always be careful about making moves that are primarily about what we don't want and being sure that we are actually following following God. Coming to the church, I think, with the mentality, not primarily what, what can the church do for me, but what can I do for the, for the church, if I can borrow uh, Kennedy's uh, uh, statement about mm -hmm. our country. Um, so so with, that, with that way of thinking, um, the reality in a close relationship, just as in a marriage, in a family, uh, in the church, there will be offenses. There will be things that happen that are hurtful, that, uh, that shouldn't happen. That's the process of our, of our growing, our becoming. But how we respond to those things is so significant in terms of, of the, the ongoing effect on, on us that Jesus, is, Jesus has such grace that he can enable these, um, these wounds actually to be part of our development as we look to him. Yeah, and I think that is that's so important in in thinking about this picture. Um, I guess I probably want to distinguish though between some of these, you know, those very hard relational things, mm -hmm. and you know, if you have a different kind of scenario where somebody's being sexually abused or uh, something, and mm -hmm. they need to I mean, very like need to find help, mm -hmm. very likely need to gain some distance. Yes. Um, and that immediate, I mean, obviously the immediate thing there is is help from safe people. Um, but then I'm thinking even afterwards, somebody, you know, maybe looking back on that, maybe they're now protected from the from the abuser. But it seems like that could so easily, like, you know, cloud your whole view of church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or you could feel like just, well, I've seen what, I've seen what happens in church and I don't want any of it or whatever. Mm. And obviously... You know, God wants a more redemptive mm -hmm. response than that. But yeah, how would you I mean, try to help someone see past some of that trauma in the past mm -hmm. or something? 
Yes, well, I certainly uh, do think that it's important we don't um, encourage people to stay in relationships where uh, there is, they're crossing of boundaries like that in ways that are inappropriate. There is there is the need actually to reinforce boundaries and, and even create physical distance at times mm -hmm. um, where there's been that kind of abuse. And... Um, and and people often do need uh, help with that to be able to work through those things. Uh, there, you know, God is in His grace does give us grace, but He gives it oftentimes through other believers. Uh, <clears throat> but becoming disillusioned, I, I, I would again just want to say that that we always have to be careful that we don't, in the in the pain of a particular situation, don't lose sight of the bigger picture, and that. It is an incredible privilege to be part of God's work. And, and mm -hmm. that's where we have to come back to saying, you know, if I had a terrible uh, circumstance, that, that doesn't mean that the, the whole plan is bad. Right. Uh, just as when, when we have a very difficult personal relationship with somebody, it doesn't mean, well, I'm never going to have a relationship with anybody. We, we realize that, that that does happen, um, but uh, we are... Um, we are having the privilege of actually participating in this great work of God. And, uh, and if, we, if we can actually get a picture of the glory of that work, we're all, we can be almost desperate. I, I just want to be part of this somehow to be part of this work of God. Uh, again, not, not uh, minimizing pain and um, confusion that people can have in particular relationships and um, yeah, don't don't want to minimize that, but but don't let that particular really um, pain or difficulty obscure who God is and what He's doing in Christ and and our desire to be part of that. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, the other situation I wanted to think about um, with uh, with this theme of I think we're calling this episode something like you know, do bad churches glorify God? And maybe the framing is not quite the right framing, but, you know, thinking about how do we approach it when we have those problems. But yeah, another piece I'm thinking about here in terms of, you know, my question, do churches, how do we think about churches glorifying God when we see problems and so on, um, is just the thing of, you know, ethnic reconciliation or, how do we relate across cultural lines or whatever? Um, seems like it's a big part of Ephesians. It says God is bringing together people from everywhere, bringing them together now, walk in unity. Um, you know, some years ago, I think this was maybe attributed to various speakers, but in the mid-1900s in America, there was this saying, you know, 11 o'clock Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. And this was, you know, pre-civil rights movement when there was official segregation. Mm -hmm. And then they're saying, well, the churches are worse. And, of course, we could get into a lot of debates and get a lot of opinions if we tried to assess, you know, what exactly is the progress since then. Because some people would feel like there's been a lot of progress and others would say there's not been much progress and mm -hmm. so on. Um but still, and you know, I think about this in our in our circles. So Anabaptist perspectives, we're representing a certain um, piece of the Anabaptist movement here, and it seems like we have a hard time relating at a church level, you know, beyond people who grew up in conservative Anabaptist circles or similar circles. Um, and it makes me wonder sometimes, and I think other people ask these questions like, well, you know, are we are we missing something about these barriers or mm -hmm. partitions that Ephesians talks about Jesus taking down? Um, yeah, how do you think about some of those issues? Well, it's a big subject, uh, and I don't know that I have the answer for all of them. There is, uh, there is this tension between... Um, between likeness and diversity. And I think with with the kind of um, disintegration 
uh, or uh, breakup of the church, we do find ourselves moving toward those that are like us. I think that even as conservative Anabaptists, we should we should think in terms of uh, resisting at least some level of that of that like just being like uh, and ha- especially if we if we make it a fairly closed circle uh, that that really bothers me I, I think we should we should uh, reach out to others and and appreciate uh, where God is working in the lives of others I, I don't know um, that we can rectify everything uh, there uh, but it's a joy to me when in our congregation we have people from different backgrounds, uh, ethnic groups, uh, whether it's race or uh, sometimes uh, we, we have a number of people from other other backgrounds. And I find great joy in that, even where they bring perspectives that are different from ours. And um, I, I, I just find a lot of, of joy seeing how uh, how Jesus can bring people together uh, from uh, different backgrounds. I, I think the the New Testament example of the Jew Gentile coming together in one body is just amazing. It, uh, and and we can I, at least I can look back and think about um, well they really should have done that and that was really good you know. And yet it, sometimes it seems like more minor differences today can keep us apart. And and yet the work of Jesus is to is to bring diversity together, and I think we should rejoice in that. And actually, I, I don't know that we have to necessarily try to look for somebody diverse. Simply being open with uh, sharing uh, who Jesus is uh, with others, and um, uh, we have in our congregation uh, people from different backgrounds. And I, I it, for me, it's a it's a it's a great joy, and I, I think we should at least be open to those things. And and, and particularly, I think making our entrance uh, such that it's accessible to people. Uh, there are values in, in that conservative Anabaptists have that are good values, family values, work values, and those kinds of things. But but recognizing that people from different backgrounds can have um, can have uh, some diversity there, and we making it such that there is entrance possible that that actually they can they can come in and be part of us, one with us. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could just uh, illustrate that in in one way. So our strong family values. When we have people coming into our congregation, oftentimes they don't have those, or they might come as parts of families. Or, um, and and I think it's important that we include them in our family structures in ways that that enable them to experience the closeness, um, uh, almost like adopting them into our into our families uh, structures, so that they don't just hear about our. The family gatherings and wish they could have them, but that they can actually participate in those kinds of things. That would be an, an, an illustration of ways that we can actually pull them in in, in good ways. Mm-hmm. And it's actually, it's actually building a community when you do That's that. That's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. A sense of, of belonging, of identity, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So I hear you talk about two pieces there. The one is the importance of, you know, thinking in terms of a local church and thinking of openness. Um, And then the other one, which I think could be local church, could also maybe have to do with just, you know, who we associate with and so on. You talked about resisting that, that pull toward, you know, we associate with like and it becomes exclusive or becomes Mm -hmm. our um, insular or whatever. Um, yeah, do you have any practical, any other practical tools or thoughts on what that means to resist that? Um, I know in the last episode, you talked about some of your purposes related to, you know, not creating disunity and what you can do, um, individually. Um, yeah, any practical suggestions on resisting the, yeah, the pull to be insular maybe. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think again the 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 bottom line is a um, 
a strong commitment to Jesus, focus on him and encouraging it in in anyone that we interact with who who loves Jesus. And uh, in that, uh, recognizing that um, there are times when they may, um, we may find that that their questions and their challenges actually are healthy for us, where, where we actually have um, barriers or hurdles, maybe it would be the uh, the thing to to them actually joining with us, and and there are times when uh, we may have just grown up with something and it just seems like the right thing to do and their way of thinking is 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 not that way and it can be on just practical uh, everyday kinds of living where if if unconsciously we're putting pressure on them uh, i'm just saying as an example we often do our own gardening and canning and things like that and it's almost like a uh, it's it's almost a part of our faith, and it can uh, it can seem like, and people who don't maybe don't grow up with that um, are um, uh, feel like oh if I need to join your congregation I need to have a garden uh, and uh, and it can uh, I remember one um, uh, young lady that was uh, coming to our church one of the things that she struggled with was a different view on pets it was uh, it was surprising to me because I knew that there were people in our church who had pets but for her you know having a dog in her house and so on is very very significant and somehow she had picked up that that wasn't real acceptable uh, among us and I, I just think those kinds of things can be hurdles that are just unconscious um, values or practices or um, and and again, where where we can focus on loving people as they are, uh, you know, there there are a number of places where uh, where I run into it um, would be on things like uh, government assistance, for example. Our the place where we live is is a lot of people enjoy government assistance. They take whatever they can, and um, even if that can help them to avoid. Uh, are keeping their income low enough that they can that they can participate in some of those things and and for us we have a strong work ethic and but again we uh, uh, being able to interact with them in ways that that um, help to nurture their their love for Jesus and these kinds of things are things that we'll talk about and and interact with what we what we we see them sometimes helping us as they they uh, maybe push against some of the things that w- we are thinking we need to listen, we need to care, need to uh, sometimes they actually will challenge us and cause us to say, wait, you know, maybe we're putting too much emphasis on something here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. And these things apply. We're talking cross-culturally here. Yeah. But these apply to relationships in, in general uh-huh. as well, which is... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts on this theme? Um, with our question, do bad churches glorify God? And if you want to tell me that's a bad way to ask the question, you can do that too. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to say that, again, we really need to, to think in terms of our, our gathering about more than just us and uh, being hmm, making life comfortable for us or solving our problems so that we enjoy church. Uh, church is not primarily about our enjoyment. It is certainly about that, but it's about the glory of God. And and uh, so when we face problems, thinking of it in terms of uh, how does this either contribute to the glory of God, how do solutions uh, or... Um, and not necessarily just about how it affects us, uh, but that's a, that's that's a, a constant tension that um, because God does want He cares about our our comfort and and enjoyment of church, right? But it's it's the bigger picture, and um, the reality is that sometimes we are detracting from the glory of God by the way that we're interacting. I mean, you see that Paul's rebuke to the Corinthians, uh, taking away from taking away from the centrality of Jesus. And, you know, he, he asked some very pointed questions. Was Jesus or was Paul crucified for you? Uh, you know, those kinds of questions, enabling them to see that they were gathering around the wrong things there. Yeah, yeah that 
that seems like maybe one of those biggest key applications out of all of this is is remembering God's doing something that is bigger than just hmm. what am I receiving. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. One thing I would say maybe additional is um, it, it's, it's actually a concept I learned in a book on marriage, but that marriage is not... It marriage, one of God's intention is that it's it's like a mirror for us. My as I interact closely with a marriage partner, I actually begin to see myself, and it's part of God's design for my growth. And I think we can apply the same to the church that uh, sometimes these difficulties in relationships are actually God's way of showing ourselves, showing us to ourselves, and through that, um, we're opening ourselves to growth and to being refined and uh, again. Um, being made more like Jesus in in the process. Yeah, no, that's a a good picture and re realistic. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, well, thank you for mm -hmm. joining us for this episode. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to this episode, and I hope it encouraged you in the situation you're in. Um, we will also link here a. Similar interview we did with Dean Taylor um, called Church is Hard, where he talked about various um, difficulties encountered in church life. Uh, you can find that linked below. Um, you can also find a link to our website um, with links to essays, a little bit more about the ministry um, and all of our content. Mm -hmm.